Welcome. Thank you for those that are joining us for the second in our careers webinar series on neuropathology. I'll get our hosts to introduce our speaker very shortly. So um, I'm from the Royal College of Pathologists. So you probably know that we're the Royal Medical College for Pathology, but you might not know that we represent 17 different specialties. Um, and in this series, we're trying to represent as many of those as we can. Um, and we really hope it's really informative um, and you get the chance to ask lots of questions at the end as well. So I'm now going to pass over to our two hosts who will introduce our speaker. I hope you enjoy the event. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm Zainab. I'm the pathology chair at UCL Medical Society. Our pathology division is quite new. So we're in our third year at the moment and we're quite keen on doing lots of events. And um, we thought a careers in pathology kind of series would be really useful because that's maybe something that medical students don't really hear much about. Um, so we're very happy um, to be able to collaborate on this with uh, Penny and the Royal College of Pathologists and also the University of Manchester Pathology Society. So um, this is the second webinar in this series and I'm going to hand over to Rosie now. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Rosie. I'm chair of the Manchester Pathology Society for this year. Um, we were really, really glad to start working on this with the Royal College and the UCL Medical Society as well. It's been really, really good so far. Um, and this talk should be very, very good as well. So I will pass you on to our consultant neuropathologist, Samar. Thank you, um, Rosie and Zainab, and thank you, Penny. Um, just going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen. So um, I've been asked to give you a little bit of information about neuropathology, what it is, how I got into it. Um, and hopefully encourage some of you uh, to do likewise. Um, so I'm going to start with what, you know, describing what it is very briefly. Um, well, um, diagnostically, um, where the pathologists that will look at uh, brain and spinal cord tumours usually, uh, biopsies um, and principally supporting the neurosurgical, neuro-oncology services within a hospital. We also work with neurologists um, and look there at muscle and nerve biopsies and occasionally non-tumor related brain lesions such as um, biopsies for query encephalitis, you know, brain inflammation. We look at cerebrospinal fluid, where we look at the cytology of that, um, and I can go into that later. Also, post-mortems and um, examination of uh, the brain at post-mortem. Some departments also cover ocular eye pathology, um, although um, increasingly there are now centres um, around the UK that, that do ophthalmic pathology as, as a, as a, as a subspecialty. In terms of um, what else we do, we, we have lots of links with other pathology disciplines. Penny mentioned that there are several that the college covers, but within histopathology, mostly the, the, our links are with histopathology and molecular pathology. So there in histo, where we will be looking um, collaborating with uh, pathologists who have musculoskeletal um, uh, sort of special specialist interests. So bone, that means bone and soft tissue. So as, as neurosurgeons are basically looking at spinal cord or brain lesions, they may come across bone and soft tissue pathology on the way. So we may sometimes get sent bone and soft tissue, which we often need help um, with specialist musculoskeletal pathologist, hematological malignancies, usually to, to review and characterize um, in more detail um, ex examples of lymphoma that can affect the brain and metastatic disease, which will cover um, lots of other pathology disciplines. That's when tumours are metastasizing from, from, from the body to the brain. 
Our other major um, link is with molecular pathology increasingly, as now we have not only to describe the morphology of a tumor, but also um, integrate its molecular profile. And then microbiology, virology, immunology, chemical pathology, as well as forensic pathologies are other specialist areas that we may link up with, but mostly it's um, other histopathology specialisms and molecular pathology that we link up with. What do we do? Well, we do our diagnostic work, as I've just explained. Um, CPC means clinical pathological conferences. That's when we present maybe difficult cases to neurosurgical or oncology or neurology colleagues so that they can be educational or um, uh, you know bringing more brains together if you like um, uh, on to complex cases there's a lot of professional um, uh, work that we have to do it may be within committees we might be wo doing working groups on particular areas of college activity for example Service improvement is, is a big area for all of us in, in clinical medicine anyway, but also in pathology and CPD, continuing professional development, staying up to date. We're involved, like other pathologists, with undergraduate and postgraduate training, and I've listed some examples there. Um, how did I become a neuropathologist? Um, I was going to spend the next few slides sort of explaining my own personal journey, if you like, and it was quite a scenic route. So although in the next few slides are going to be presented as a straight line, my route to neuropathology was um, anything but a straight line. So many, many, many years ago, probably before some of you were born, I went to medical school. Um, I did an intercalated BSc where I got my first taste really in uh, laboratory um, sort of science. Um, then did what we what were called then pre-registration house officer jobs and SHO jobs um, in medicine, rotating through different um, specialties and uh, got to acting registrar in general medicine. At that point, um, I got more interested really in moving, having done the BSc, the research was still sort of something that I wanted to get back into. And I did a period of time in clinical research where I worked in a memory clinic and supervised clinical trials for dementia. And that got me interested really in, in dementia. How does, how does dementia develop? What's the pathogenesis of the disease? How, how, how does it progress? And therefore, how can we develop effective therapeutic strategies to treat this very debilitating disease? So I decided to do a PhD, but I, I took about a year doing accident and emergency in order to get funding together to do a PhD. I really enjoyed accident and emergency, actually. And if I hadn't have become a pathologist, I'd have probably stayed in a and &E. It's a fascinating area. So then I did a PhD. I went into, into basic science, neuroscience, where I did a PhD in three years, and then I postdoced for a year, and my work was on the on the pathogenesis of dementia. An opportunity then came up to I saw um, a job advert for a lecturer in pathology, and I wondered about this. You know, how what what is that? I didn't really know that I could do pathology, and I wandered up to the prof, the head of department, and I said. I've not been doing clinical medicine for a bit. Can I do pathology? Can a doctor do pathology? And that's when I discovered pathology really. So I started my training in 98, first as an SHO, then a specialist registrar. And I shifted from general histopath into neuropathology because of my interest in dementia and the pathogenesis of dementia. I then became a consultant, um, a neuropathologist, and also got interested in, in organizational development. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Following on from that, I, well, during that time, because there's a bit of overlap, as you can see from the dates, I got very interested in, in emerging digital health, digital pathology, technology, and how that can improve diagnostics. 
and I did a master's degree in capacity building to to understand how we could build capacity and to, to implement new innovations in healthcare. So I did quite um, a circuitous route to neuropathology and you'll find if you speak to neuropathologists, a lot of us have done lots of different things um, before we eventually ended up becoming neuropathologists. So I took, I took a block of time out of clinical medicine really having started off wanting to be initially a clinical pharmacologist or a nephrologist I decided really I wanted to do more basic science for a while and then I did something entirely different where I became director of a digital health project and I learned about um, new innovations and technologies that can be used to improve healthcare and became very interested then in organizational development and service improvement. So it's quite a long route to, to, to where I've got. What does a typical day look like for me? Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we, we do intraoperative smears. Um, so this, this will happen um, sometime during the day. Um, surgeons will ring up and say that they're operating on someone and they want to do an intraoperative smear. In other words, they want a diagnosis intraoperatively to make to, to decide if they're in the right place. Have they got tumour? What type of tumour have they got? So what happens in this in this series of pictures is they send a fresh sample of, of brain of presumed tumour to us. Uh, we smear it between two glass slides stain it um, so that it looks something like this I look at it under the microscope this is what it looked like this is under the microscope it's a smear of cells and we have to decide from that whether it's normal um, if it or if it's abnormal if is it tumor if it's tumor is it actually of the brain substance itself or of the coverings of the brain if it's tumor, is it a primary brain tumor or has it metastasized from somewhere else? And we have to make this decision very rapidly because the patient is still being operated on. And we ring the neurosurgeons up and let them know what the diagnosis is. And that will determine what they do next surgically. So we're, we're in close contact with the neurosurgeons. We then um, do um, our diagnostic work. So what I'm gonna try and do is shift us to what I do day to day. Now you can access this. This is the Leeds Virtual Pathology um, resource, which you can look at if you're interested um, uh, in Leeds. And they've got a slide library and you can search it. I've searched for uh, neurological cases. And so this is what we can look at. This is somebody who, had, who has um, a tumor in their brain and as I move, hopefully you can see the slide. You've got um, two fragments of tumor, a little bit lighter here and here. That's telling me at low power that it's necrotic. So it's dead tumor. Um, and then as you look at the very cellular, this is very abnormal. This isn't what normal brain would look like. These are all malignant astrocytic cells. Um, there are lots of lots of these. There will be mitotic figures. There's necrosis. The vessels are very plump. So we make a diagnosis. This is one of the high grade, what we call high grade glial tumors, glioblastoma. So we uh, that's part day to day. That is what we do. Um, if I just take this back, sorry. Let me just close that. The other thing that I wanted to say is that we tend to be, as pathologists, part of a wider team. So this is the big laboratory team that I, the, that I work with. So the specimens arrive here in specimen reception. These are all photographs from where I work in Sheffield. Um, the specimens are booked in. Um, then they're described by a pathologist um, and placed into these white cassettes. Um, they're processed in lots of different types of machines, usually overnight. Um, and then they're embedded in wax as this um, biomedical scientist is doing so that they can be made ready 
to cut into thin sections that then can be stained or, or automated now in the laboratories um, to produce histology slides that then come to us uh, to examine. This is what the slides will look like. Um, nowadays, we can load these slides into large scanners that scan them at high resolution to produce digital images. So actually, I don't need necessarily a microscope. I could be sat working remotely, uh, making the diagnosis on digital images. So basically, um, we work as, as I was just saying, as part of a wider team of biomedical scientists and uh, administrative clerical staff in the Department of Pathology, and also a wider team yet more still uh, when we work with our multidisciplinary colleagues um, with radiology, surgery, oncology, and so on, um, to pull together the pathology and the clinical findings to, to, to put forward a, a plan of action for that particular patient's treatment. So we work in lots of teams. I also see myself as part of an even wider team, and this is quite an interesting diagram of um, the Northern Cancer Alliance that's describing it all of its activities. And all of these sticks, I think, are where pathologists work, where we're where, where part of public engage. We can do public engagement. We're part of a, a clinical expert net, networks. We're very much about de developing and improving our services. To, to improve diagnosis and reduce health inequalities, improving the diagnostic pathways and mod modernizing cancer workforce. That's really about education and building capacity there. And of course, we're all patient centered just because we're not working directly with the patient, we're very much patient centered. What does a typical day look like? For me, this is, I've just taken a couple of slides of, of, of my diary. Um, I'll be diagnosing, uh, you know, um, tumours, as I've just shown. I might be looking at smears. Um, I might be t attending uh, multidisciplinary team meetings. This is a genomic tumour advisory board. Increasingly, we do more molecular studies. So we have a genomics advisory board that we, we attend so that we can fine tune diagnoses. Um, with, with our genomics colleagues. Um, we might be doing multidisciplinary team meetings. I lead on pituitary tumours here, for example. There might be professional development. This is about leadership skills. Um, I'm having a coffee here with a pathology registrar. I've, I've just blanked out people's names for confidentiality about a research project. Here it's a round table with collaborators at another university on, a, on an AI, artificial intelligence pro, uh, a project that I'm involved with. So my days, my week is very different. It's never the same. Um, I'm also involved in uh, service improvement. And here it's actually on prostate pathology pathway. So I'm a little bit away from the brain. Some weeks I might be away at conferences. So this particular week, there were three days of conference, one on digital health and AI and data, and another one on medical imaging where I presented work on digital pathology. Uh, I'm interested in innovation. So the trust I work at has a Dragon's Den type activity where clinicians can present uh, novel ideas of, for innovation and service improvement. And, and we treat it a little bit like a dragon's den situation where they present their case and we ask them questions. And I'm involved in, in professional activities. So here, the Professional Affairs Committee for the British Neuropathological Society. So as you can see, very varied. Usually, no two days are the same. And you can make really of it what you want according to what you find you become interested in as your career develops. The other thing I have to do is stay up to date. The, the pathology is going through an incredible pace of change in terms of our diagnostics. So when I started training, all I'd have to basically do when I'm diagnosing tumours is provide a histological diagnosis, for example, diffuse astrocytoma, three examples being given in this paper, and have to give it a World Health Organization grade this one, for example, grade two, to that will determine the, the types of treatment that patients will get. But now 
we have to do a lot more. We've got to provide an integrated diagnosis that not only looks at the histology down a microscope or on your digital screen, but also brings in molecular information because all of the molecular information can act as prognostic or predictive um, information to guide the oncologist into what treatment is best for that particular patient. And this molecular pathology is advancing at pace um, almost um, you know, within the same year we're adding, we're adding new diagnostic criteria. So fast pace of change is what I would say neuropathology has. It's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed doing it. Um, it's hard work, uh, but mostly fun as I've written there. I've had an opportunity to do all sorts of things that I didn't really think I'd be doing when I started out. Here, I set up a digital pathology facility in, at a university, so I learned how to write business cases. Um, I've, I've done a lot of public engagement with uh, through the college. So this was one that we did with the Science and Media Museum um, when we presented uh, an exhibition on pathology and diagnosing disease. I've done um, public engagement with schools. Uh, we've done public engagements down here on the right in Parliament to let MPs know about digital pathology. Um, I've worked um, here in this in this picture with a couple of hands and a, what looks like an input device, a turquoise input device, um, with design students to, to, to design better input devices for digital pathology because using a mouse is horrible. Um, I've worked here with, there's a little video, YouTube Digital Pathology Explained. This is working with media students to make me an animation to explain digital pathology to the general public. And I've been able to publish in this area as well, um, looking at how we might implement digital pathology by looking at um, learning experiences in digital health more generally. In the bottom right hand corner here, um, I developed a master's program um, to include digital pathology. And this van here is a remote chemotherapy unit that, um, that, that I learned about and bought to give us a talk when we were looking at how we might improve uh, oncology services uh, to, to patients. So it's covered neuropathology for me has covered lots of different areas um, and, and it's taken me to lots of places that I wouldn't really have expected when I started out. How do you find out how about neuropathology if you wanted to do it? I'd recommend the college website, the very good um, sort of uh, information about training in neuropathology here on the left and on the right, um, what the neuropathology exams like. The British Neuropathological Society is very good as um, for pro to, to provide you with um, the curriculum for neuropathology. So those, those two main areas, uh, RCPATH and BNS are very good if you're interested in finding out more details. And that's it. Um, this, this is a sort of winding route that some of you will be at the start of. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Samar, thank you so much for that talk. It was really good, um, very insightful and very interesting. And it was also just really nice to see the way that, you know, you don't have to limit yourself. You can sort of explore one area of medicine and maybe think that's what you're going to into, but then you can always do something different. And I think that's one of the nice things about medicine. Um, so Rosie and I will have a look at the Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I think there's one in the chat right now, which is, um, is it necessary to carry out a neurology slash neurological rotation as a doctor during the switch from histopathology to neuropathology training? Not, 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 not from, if you're already doing histopathology, um, no, because you will have started on the route of, histo of, of histopath training anyway, because part one of, um, of your exams is, is a general pathology exam. And then people tend to move for the last three years of their sort of specialist training um, into neuropathology, if that's what they're pl planning to do. So, um, no, you don't. You, if you're already in histopath, 
there's a route to doing neuropathology. Thank you. Um, someone's asked, do you use sequencing alongside histology? Yes, that's what I, I was saying earlier. So um, we we will make we will make a diagnosis, what I call a morphological diagnosis, so um, histological diagnosis by looking at the tumor. And there are particular um, criteria for making particular diagnoses. So once you've done that, um, then basically, so that's where you might say, um, you know, glioblastoma, CNS, WHO grade four. But actually now what you have to do is, is send for molecular testing where you can do um, sequencing, where we can do methylation profi uh, array profiling that can then categorize the tumor uh, more genetically. And some of those findings then will have an impact on, on, uh, on prediction or, or, or therapeutic um, sort of utility. So, yeah, that's 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 been that's been a substantial change. If you think about the practice, uh, when I started training, I would do hematoxin and eosin, and maybe some immunohistochemistry, and then we'd make the diagnosis on that. But now we do that plus the molecular for most for for most neuro tumors. Thank you, um, and. Someone else is asking, can a biomedical scientist build a career in neuropathology and become a specialist? Um, you, I think, well, we, we've got in, in, it will depend on different trusts. So in the trust that I work in, um, we have uh, biomedical scientists that have neuro, that are specialized in neuropathology. So that will be their area because, um, there are some areas that, that, for example, we would handle tissue quite differently. So, for example, if we've got a muscle biopsy, that requires specialist biomedical sciences um, input. Um, and so they, they will tend to do them rather than it doesn't normally go through the normal route of, a, of, 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 a, of in the laboratory. So, yes, as a biomedical scientist, you can specialize to have neuropathology and we often have biomedical scientists rotating into neuro and then into general um, they our our biomedical sciences colleagues can also um, uh, also do intraoperative smears so when the sample comes to the lab they will do the smear and then stain it and then bring it to us in some trusts it might be the the consultant or the trainee that does that so there are there are routes for 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 doing that, but um, not as um, at the moment. There are some advanced practitioner and consultant biomedical scientist roles that would allow you to make some diagnose to make the diagnosis as a pathologist was, but I don't think that exists yet in neuropathology. Okay, thank you. Um... Does anyone else have any more questions? Because I think those are all the ones that are on the chat. I think Rosie answered a couple um, as well. Yeah. Oh, oh I think yeah. one more. Um, yeah, so thank you for such an interesting talk. I have completed a master's in molecular neuroscience from the University of Bristol and will be soon completing my training in histopathology in India. I'm very interested in a career in neuro-oncology. Could you please suggest the best way forward? Um, I don't, I'm not the best person to, to advise in terms of uh, neuro-oncology training, uh, but I would guess um, speaking to neuro-oncologists in your centre would be a, a really good start because they'd be able to provide you with, with, with probably good guidance about how, how best to, to follow that aspiration. Um, I think that, that might be the, the, the best way. Thank you. And uh, someone's saying, are you starting to incorporate AI into your diagnostic pathways? Um, no, we're not doing that in, in neuropathology as yet, but I mean, we're having a chat beforehand, but AI is certainly something that is gathering pace in pathology, certainly at, at a research level. Um, we're lucky in the UK in that we've got 
we've got three centers of excellence in pathology, digital pathology and, and AI. Um, so in Leeds, um, we've got a program called NPIC, you can look it up, um, Warwick um, in the West Midlands. Um, uh, there's also uh, something called Pathlake, which is digital pathology. And also in Glasgow, uh, this program was called ICAD, which covered digital pathology. And all of those centers have regional extensions um, from where they are. So Oxford can be involved in Belfast and so on. So there's a lot of connectivity and they've produced quite a lot of work on uh, developing AI exemplars. And it's mostly being looked at at the moment in, in uh, special specialties like prostate pathology, breast pathology, um, GI pathology, but um, those areas that are, that are high volume. Um, neuropathology is lower volume compared to, to, to those ones that I've just mentioned. Um, so it, it's watched this space really for AI, very interesting area. Yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see how that develops in the next 10, 15 yeah. years as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then someone is saying, at what stage in histopathology training would we apply for neuropathology? I think um, the people that I know that have, that have applied and got um, posts in neuropathology have done that after they've got their part one in their examination. Um, there, there, there are, um, and I, I would probably, they have to I would advise you to look at the at the website for, for very specific details but the calls for applications do come out uh, on a regular basis but it's usually usually you will have had your done your part one got your part one um, and then you do part two um, in neuropathology yeah thank you um, and then are there any pathology degrees you would recommend to intercalate with as a medical student um, I think I I would keep it quite, I mean, I did an intercalated BSc, BSc as I, we were discussing earlier, and I did mine in um, pharmacology, uh, medical science. Um, I think it, I mean, it could be a pathology related discipline, but I think what uh, an intercalated BSc that would give you insight into scientific method, into laboratory work, um, into even it might even be something because you know we're not that there'll be there'll be roles and jobs that we have that don't yet exist so sort of try and look into the future it might be clinical informatics um, you know because data is going to be really important understanding data uh, data science computer science you know you Computer computational pathology is 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 emerging as a big discipline, so it might not be what the the classical subjects that you're thinking of in terms of pathology. I would look into what the future might be. So yeah, I would uh, clinical informatics, data, bioinformatics. That all of those are going to be really important in how we interpret uh, our, our you know pathology in the future. So do what you like, I think. Do what you're interested in. It's a good, good, good place to start. Yes, definitely. I think Zainab just had an internet problem then. Um, oh, she's back. Okay. Um, for that, that was very interesting. Thank you. That's all the questions we seem to have in the chat. Um, yeah, sorry, my Wi-Fi crashed there. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. So is it the PowerPoint right now? Because we, um, I think, so we do have a, another event coming up as well. Very similar webinar on virology and microbiology. Um, and in terms of certificates for this event as well, you will get one. They'll be sent out in the near future. Um, so that's great. Does anyone have any final questions before we wrap up? Nope. Uh, do we have the slides with the college social medias? Um, oh, yes. That is a good point. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the Royal College does have a YouTube as well that you can find a recording of this webinar on. 
Uh, there we go. Okay. So Instagram and then there's the YouTube as well, which the recording will be on. Yeah. And um, just in the previous slide, if uh, Rosie, as Rosie mentioned, we have another webinar coming up and that's on the 8th of February. So 6 to 7 p.m. again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you to everyone for coming. And thank you, Samar. It was very, very good. Thank you.